determine which way of life shall survive, their way or our way. For the stakes this time are the greatest men have ever fought for. This time it's a fight not between man and man, but between nation and nation. If you could just one time state your name. Sure, my name is Charles Hamilton Houston III. My grandfather is a well-known civil rights lawyer, as you know. Charles was born in 1895. Um, he was the son of William uh, and Mary. He was drawn towards racial justice and a reckoning of, uh, of equality, and it's something that he was really uh, strongly um, in favor of, particularly after serving uh, in World War I. W.B. Du Bois was arguably the most important spokesperson for the race during World War I. With the Crisis Magazine, uh, he had a very powerful platform uh, for expressing his views as well as advancing the agenda of the NAACP. He was, in theory, opposed to war, uh, considered himself a pacifist, um, but he was also intrigued with Woodrow Wilson's call for the United States to enter the war to make the world safe for democracy. So he made the choice, the very deliberate choice, to support the war effort. Uh, and this was a choice that he would ultimately regret uh, for the duration of his life. So you have someone like A. Philip Randolph, who was a socialist. He was pretty much on one of the pioneers, I'd say, of black socialists um, in this country. And that approach to gaining civil rights, of course, one of those things was not participating in World War I. The assertion made sense when we're thinking about black people in this country. Why are we fighting for freedom for other people when ours aren't even guaranteed here? The military decided, uh, really, once uh, the selective service system, once the draft went into effect, uh, that the vast majority of African Americans were eff effectively going to be laborers in uniform. And they carried that policy throughout the duration um, of the war, both domestically as well as overseas. Those prejudices go from war to war to war. So they're there in the Civil War, they're there in the First World War, and they're there in the Second World War. Black units, often commanded by white officers, uh, uh, would sometimes uh, have their racial characteristics uh, blamed for any kind of military setback. This spoke to how ideas of um, biological racism were deeply ingrained into uh, the military, um, as well as the deep traditions uh, within uh, the military, even going back to the Civil War, of using African Americans primarily as as laborers, seeing that this was their their natural, um, they were naturally suited uh, to serve in this uh, capacity, both uh, kind of biologically, as well as um, kind of temperamentally, uh, as well. African Americans had a vision of serving in the war as combatants. And this went directly back to their uh, aspirations for manhood. The question was not whether to serve, the question was how to serve. And so he chose to uh, take control of his own destiny, so to speak, and um, attempt to become an officer. The United States military, like most militaries, is organized hierarchically. There's a class system involved. The ranks ascend, of course, from you know the uppermost general to the lowermost private. They are also in two distinct classes, the officer class and the enlisted class. Lieutenant is not just one step up from sergeant. It's a different world. The fight for African American officers was a civil rights struggle. It was something that the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People took up as a key issue, as well as the black press. They began to lobby uh, the War Department for the establishment of a all-black officers training camp. They argued that African Americans needed to have the opportunity to serve as officers, whether it was a Jim Crow camp or not. The Central Committee of Negro College Men was an organization designed to increase the ranks of and gain access for African American officers in the United States military. Charles Hamilton Houston was assigned to a camp in southern France, and he, along with other black officers, were subjected to really horrific treatment. The dispute related to the white soldier's belief, the white American soldier's belief, that uh, this 
black officer um, had been improperly keeping the company uh, of a white French woman. And um, that inflamed and offended their sensibilities. And so uh, they wanted to uh, invoke their particular brand of racial justice. Houston and his colleague entered the fray and began to try to de-escalate the situation. Unfortunately, things got really tense and ultimately no, no, no harm befell them, but it was pretty apparent that he and the other two black soldiers were in danger of being lynched by fellow American service members wearing the same uniform. On the one hand, they were fighting for their country, while at the same time, they were fighting for their race. And this is what African-American soldiers had to struggle with, had to contend with, especially upon their return following their service, recognizing that their racial identity was seen as more important in a negative sense in the eyes of their fellow white Americans than their Americanness. And this resulted in the post-war period being one of the most volatile periods for African Americans in United States history. The KKK, of course, starts after the Civil War and then a number of federal pieces of legislation intended to, to tamp down the KKK actually works. And the movement as it's known after the Civil War is really dead by the early 1870s. And it goes dormant. And then in the 19 teens, uh, there is a lot of talk about the Great Migration and the fact that Black Americans are now showing up in places they didn't live in before. They also were concerned about this kind of rise in militancy and agency among Black Americans. So the new Klan was a much more equal opportunity. You know, haters, they were, they, you know, they were focused on a bigger group of people, but absolutely a core part of their, of their focus in the 20s was also on um, the, the phrase people were using was the new Negro, right? This enlightened black veteran who had gone to Europe, had been treated well, had seen that there was not the same kind of racism in Europe as there was in the United States and came home and was sort of, again, questioning these big picture values that the world seemed to be talking about that didn't apply in the town that they lived in. We think of Rosa Parks being the first person to sort of sit in the segregated side of the bus. She was by far not the first person. This was happening a lot during the post-war era of, of World War I, where black men in particular in their, in their uniform would sit in segregated sections trying to show that they deserve to be fully citizen. And those instances and flashes of resistance resulted in major responses from Southerners. A lynching is a extrajudicial murder. But for African Americans, lynching was much more than that. It was much more than just a legal definition. Lynching was a form of terrorism. In the late 19th century, that starts to become a spectacle, becomes something that you go to watch in the South if you're a white person, as a retribution against Black people who somehow overstepped their bounds. In the context of the war, and in the specific context of a Black military service, it had to do with the uniform and what the uniform represented. How the uniform represented America and the claims that African-American soldiers made to their Americanness and their American citizenship. And all of these different kind of symbolic meanings of the, of the uniform, of military service, ran against the customs, the beliefs, the traditions of white supremacy, especially in the South. It's sort of ordinary citizens. And because it was so well accepted, we have a lot of images to sort of prove this, that you see just ordinary people looking at the camera with this lynched body right behind them. When you have 15,000 people involved, it's a, it's a community effort. The Klan does this weird thing in the 20s in that they are a political organization as much as they are a vigilante organization. And so you actually end up with politicians who are, they're not in the Klan party, they don't run that way, but they're, be, they're running with the very clear approval of the Klan. And you see politicians getting into state legislatures as well as Congress from places like Colorado, um, not the Deep South, right? Places in the West. 
Um, so there are some states where the Klan is essentially in power. And in lots of southern states, of course, just the way it was before 1900, after 1900, you see there's no punishment for, um, for violence against African Americans. And you see people pushing, you know, as early as the 1890s for a federal anti-lynching law. Ida B. Wells, you know, these kind of pioneering black intellectuals sort of pushing for a federal law that will supersede state law so that the federal government can punish people for engaging in violence against black Americans when states refuse to do so because the states are being run by the Klan or by white supremacists. Even when they get national attention like the, lyn the lynching of Emmett Till, here was a boy who was lynched during the civil rights movement and his attackers are actually put on trial, but still his lynchers get off. Ultimately, courts are local institutions and they reflect what the local community who's in power wants to happen. And so they don't want to prosecute their own. They don't want to prosecute those people that they feel something in common with. And as long as juries are all white, as long as the police, the prosecutor, the judges are all white, that's not going to change much because they're going to always identify with the white mob before they're going to identify with the black man who was murdered or dismembered or burned alive. Black soldiers in arms meant uh, for white populations was the fear that armed black Americans would seek vengeance. And this is not often voiced. It's often more blamed on the instincts of uh, black Americans uh, and the actual source of the guilt uh, of why this might be caused is not necessarily brought to the surface, but it especially plays out in the fear of sexual crimes being committed by black soldiers. This is a fear that white populations have, white enemy populations have certainly. Really, this is a kind of reversal because the history of slavery is a long, continuously perpetrated sex crime against black women performed by white men. The idea that black soldiers were predators was so ingrained uh, and so reflexive for the ra you know, racist authorities that black soldiers were disproportionately amongst those executed in the Second World War. It's not necessarily saying that no black soldiers committed crimes. Uh, it's saying that when a black soldier was accused of a crime, they fared much worse in the proceedings of a trial uh, and sentencing than their white counterparts. Among these black soldiers returning from World War I were Charles Hamilton Houston, and he served as an officer and he also served in like their legal divisions. After trying to advocate for the rights of black soldiers during the war, a lot of his cases and a lot of his suggestions, um, having them struck down or dismissed, it was in those moments that he dedicated himself to fighting for the rights of people that weren't able to fight for themselves. Coming back to DC, I think, was formative for him, and it reintroduced him to his roots, to being a black man in a largely black city at a critical time of racial reckoning in this country. He was keenly aware of the disparities in treatment that um, African Americans received, even those who had served their country honorably in the war. Coming back to DC allowed him to begin what would become a storied path toward justice. He enrolls at Harvard Law School. He's one of the first blacks to be admitted to the Harvard Law Review's editorial board. He graduates and he eventually becomes the dean of Howard Law School. He mentors and trains up a generation of black attorneys that would go on to secure civil rights. And among these people are Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall was one of Houston's best and brightest students. His genius and, and, and brilliance were unparalleled. And as a result, Houston hired Marshall to come work with him um, at the NAACP. And together, uh, the two of them um, began to work on a 20-year arc of litigation, ultimately cul culminating in, uh, in Brown v. Board of Education. It was part of the systematic plan to dismantle Plessy v. Ferguson's doctrine of separate but equal. When the Brown v. Board decision comes down um, in 1954, there's this palpable sense of relief that we're actually getting somewhere. There's actually going to be something different. So the legal route um, seems to bear fruit, but it ends up just being totally undermined by the fanatical willingness of white Southerners to, to prevent 
racial equality from, from growing among their children. Institutions are great because they give us, you know, structure and stability, but they also maintain power relationships. They maintain cultural ideas for far longer than the people who created those things. Racism doesn't just go away because some people start thinking nicer things, but it's not until we like somehow figure out ways to get the criminal justice system to stop seeing black and brown people as separate. Until those things happen, it's hard to stop racism. Houston made the calculated decision to continue working, to continue his fight, despite some very real personal health issues um, that put his own life and health in jeopardy. What he concluded was that, listen, in any fight, some are going to fall. And he continued the work, continued the struggle uh, to his own personal detriment for the betterment um, of society at large, in particular, for the increased opportunities that he was hoping to create for his son and future generations. It really is, you know, a noble struggle, and um, it's one that uh, isn't widely known, but the man quite literally gave his life to make this country a better place. The Civil Rights Movement is often taught in our history classes as the solution to everything. But we know that there are persistent problems that stretch beyond the 1960s. What we get when we get Brown versus Board of Education is a judiciary decision. Judiciary decisions are important, but they're not everything and they're not enforceable unless the local community is what willing to enforce it. When you read about and look at the degree to which what they call massive resistance, right? It was a movement of massive resistance to civil rights by white Southerners. Um, they did so much work to undermine Brown that within four or five years, Brown was pretty much useless in the South. And it's only by understanding this history that we can, we can start to undo it. <laughs>